Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Lord, as we begin our week, we ask you, Father, to be with us and lead us and guide us. We pray, Father, for a for a moving of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and the hearts of everyone, Lord, that comes. We uh, thank you for this time together right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Trinity Baptist Church. Looks like it started raining on us, didn't it? All right. We need that rain, don't we? <laughs> I don't know. We've had a lot of rain this last month. But uh, anyway, we're glad that you're here. She looks good to see you. And uh, we're glad that you're here and hope you enjoy the service today. I know we have a very busy week ahead of us. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a good week. And it's like Sister Blair said, if we use up every bit of our resources the first night, we'll just go to the store the next day and get some more, right? And uh, that would be a wonderful thing to take place. Uh, in the way of announcements, if you'd like to follow here on your bulletin, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, which is normal time to start, we're going to have a kickoff for our VBS, and uh, she has ice cream for us. And... Uh, of course, you can see all the bees and all the decorations. And I'm going to move out of the way where you can see our beehive. If you haven't seen our beehive, I like our beehive. Right? Uh, and it says, "Be busy about the Lord's work." And so that's the theme for the VBS this year. And so many people have done so much work to be getting ready for this and so much planning. I know we had a meeting here Friday and Betty was going over about how the meals and all that stuff and all that's being looked at and taken care of and all the planning for the, uh, the crafts and all the planning for the lessons and, and all that's gone into it. I know also the men have worked on the playground and a lot of time and effort's been put in to have that ready for the children. And, and it's just been one of the busiest years for VBS that, 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 that I can remember, at least that I've helped with. <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of work's been done in the past, but I haven't done a lot of that work. But this year I've been involved in some of the work, and I just wanted to say uh, that it's, it's a joy and a pleasure to get to be here. All right, also, next Sunday <coughs> evening... Uh, choir practice starts back, and I'm excited about this. It's the first Sunday in August, and so uh, we'll be having choir back up here shortly after, after a few practices, and we'll be having choir practice start next Sunday evening, and of course that will be at 5 o'clock. Uh, service starts at 6, so choir practice will start at 5 next Sunday evening. All right. Are there any other announcements? <coughs> Vacation Bible School is every evening this week from 6 to 8.30. And so uh, I'm hoping to have the van. Uh, I know the guy's working on it, trying to get it ready, and hoping he'll figure out what the problem is. But if not, I'm going to run my little van, and I'll just make two or three trips. Right? And we'll just have somebody here to watch them while I drop them off and go get more. But either way, any of them that we need to pick up, we can. Uh, any other announcements? We got two phone calls yesterday of people out in the community that are calling about bringing their kids. So I'll get five just from the two that called. Amen. So. Yeah. Really? <coughs> Sunday school report. We've had 13, we've had one kindergarten today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But uh, <clears throat> call those that didn't make it for your Sunday school, right? Okay. Do we have any birthdays and anniversaries? I have not looked on the book. <clears throat> He's here. Stand up. Bobby Blair, birthday. How old are you? 32? 32. All right, Bobby, 32. Let's all sing, right? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. mention our association work. Uh, we have a men's ministry that has met this past week. Uh, some of the larger churches, Brother Sellers brought together a group of men, I don't know, five or six men from five or six of the larger churches to try to encourage men's ministry. Uh, that will involve later down the road uh, trying to build up our RA program. Be praying for these RA leaders. We need four RA leaders in the association. And those RA leaders are going to try to promote RAs in the individual churches. So the men's ministry, men's ministry, and the RA leaders at this level trying to promote RAs in the, uh, in the surrounding churches. Be in prayer for this group of men. Be in prayer for Brother Sellers. Uh, he's very passionate about this because of his work at the Children's Center. You think about that. For years, he saw children from these broken homes and broken families. He saw them coming in, and now he's uh, he's our uh, director, and that's where he's going. You think about that. He's seen it for years. He's seen it, and so let's pray about this and try to support him. Uh, some of the names. Uh, Jerry mentioned Linda English's son has COVID, uh, Mike Reynolds, Tim Edwards, Parkinson's, and uh, these are three that she mentioned. All right, are there any others that we need to bring our attention? Malia? Exactly. He did. Heath Lauderdale called me last night, and uh, he said, as I speak, Brother Bobby, I'm watching a house burn to the ground. Uh, three students, a set of twins and their seniors, and then another younger sibling are all students of his at Susan Moore High School. And he was almost in tears because he was there, and the mom, of course, she was there, very upset. And uh, he said, I'm just calling some of the pastors around, if y'all would, 
say a prayer, pray for this family, take up a love offering, whatever you think you might need to do, but let's remember that family. I don't have the name, but we'll put Heath Lauderdale there. Uh, Malia, uh, I'm going to put your mom. Others. Dina? This is Malia's first cousin. Some of you may know Doug Hill. He's in the hospital. A diabetic. Anyone else? David, did you have another? Let's all stand together and we'll have a prayer. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have a lot of people here, Lord, that are grieving today. A lot of bereaved. We've had several deaths. Father, we've had house fires, two of those mentioned. Father, we've got people that are in hospital and really struggling. We have others, Lord, that we've mentioned with cancer. I'm thinking about Dan Little. I'm thinking about Kathy Jo Cohen. These friends of mine, Father. I just ask you, Lord, to be with them. Father, I pray for these and I ask you that your Holy Spirit would minister, Lord, in ways that we can't understand. We know, Lord, you take these really difficult times, these really hard times, and, and you use them, Lord. You use them for your glory. And, and we pray, Father, that this would be the case, that, Father, you would give testimonies to these that are hurting, these that have lost everything in the house fire, these, Lord, that have suffered through so many things, these, Lord, with cancer. We pray, Lord, that you would give testimonies to these people, that they might praise your name and they might bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, that's the reason we live. And if we can do this, Lord, through these hard times, 
Father, it will point other people to you. Lord, use us, we pray. Lord, we want to ask you to be with our vacation Bible school this year, Father, as every year. Lord, we know that it's very important. The times in which we live, they demand it. The times demand that we be serious, that we take it seriously, Lord, that we be burdened over the things that are happening, Lord. The times demand it. And may we not falter. May we not be the ones to, to, to take this and brush it off as a burden that, that's not worth giving our time to, Lord. We just ask that many children, Lord, might have seeds planted. And that, Father, they would take these seeds and then they go into their homes. Father, that the homes would see the, 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 the fruits of the labor that's done here this week. Father, we pray for a blessing. Lord, we don't, we don't mind working hard. We don't mind coming together and, and doing our best, Lord, to, to try to reach out to these. Lord, give us strength. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might be what you'd have us to be. Lord, we lift up our service today. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to our hearts. I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, for every person that's here today, I thank you for them. And, Father, for them coming together to worship. Lord, we're not here because we, we don't want to be here. Lord, we're here because we want to be here. We want to be in your house. This is the Lord's day. And we know that the Lord's day is important. And we want to be here, Lord, to worship you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and use this time, we pray. And thank you again one more time so much for the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for our sin. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Our Father and the Lord in heaven. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. 
and that we get something from this sermon, Brother Wise will give us today. And when we leave here, we will make it home safe. It was good, I know that. <laughs> Classics, right? Take your Bible and turn the book of Second Kings. Second Kings chapter twenty two is probably some of my favorite scripture in all the Bible. read the whole chapter and I thought well no I'll cut it in half let's read verses 1 through 10 we'll reference some of that other Second Kings chapter 22 beginning in verse 1 one generation one generation that's what the title of service is today this is the word of God verse 1 Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. Uh, what, she would probably have been around 22, 23 years old when he was 8. I think his dad was 16 when he had him, so I would imagine his wife would have been close to that age. You can add all that up. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of David his father, and turn not aside 
to the right hand or to the left. It came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, the scribe, that would be Shaphan the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the temple. Let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work, that they have oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work, which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house. Unto the carpenters, and the builders, and the masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. <coughs> and Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan in the sky, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Shaphan the scribe. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and they have delivered in the hand of them that do the work and they have oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the high priest has delivered me a book. And look here what happens. And Shaphan the scribe read it before the king. So here we go. Times have been bad. And the king, the young king, since age 8, right? 18 years later, he's 26 years old, still young, 26 and young. Here he is, the king. And he finds out what the book of the law says for the first time. Isn't that interesting? All right, from the beginning of Saul's reign, the first king, 1052 B.C., this is important. From the first king, King Saul, 1052 B.C., to the end of Zedekiah's reign, the last king, the last king to sit upon the throne in Jerusalem, who's the next king going to be? Jesus. All right. From the first king, 1052, to the end of Zedekiah, 586, was 466 years. All right. I counted 23 kings. Josiah here, chapter 22, he is number 19 in Judah. Number 19. He was a very good king. All right, besides Saul, who was disobedient, we remember the story. We had David, the man of God, after God's own heart, right? That was David. And then you had Solomon, who ended up being very weak. Remember? Solomon, very weak. You had one, it says, that was foolish. You had ten that were evil. You had seven that the Bible says were good. And you only have one that was very good. And that was Josiah, the one we're reading about. One king after David that the Bible says was very good. Josiah was a child of prophecy. The Bible says, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1, and behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. Now Jeroboam, this was 275 years earlier, was the first king there in Judah after Solomon. Excuse me, Rehoboam. Jeroboam was of the north. Jeroboam had built two pagan altars. One in the south at Bethel. This is of the northern kingdom. One in the north at Dan. And Jeroboam, it says here of him, it says in the uh, 1 Kings 13, there came a man of God out of Judah, out of the word of the Lord, unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar, the pagan altar, 
to burn incense. He cried against the altar, the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. So Josiah was prophesied 270, 300 years earlier that he would come. <coughs> And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. All right? So Josiah was a child of prophecy. Over some 300 years earlier, it was prophesied that he would be king. 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 25. I want you to get a good picture of him. It says, And like unto him there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. So out of all these kings, you had King David, all of them measured against David. And then you had Josiah. He was a very good king. <clears throat> Verse 1, Josiah, 640 to 609 B.C. Why eight years old? It says there in verse 1, Josiah was 8 years old when uh, he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. So he'd been 39 when he died, right? All right. Josiah's father, King Ammon, was murdered around age 24. So that means he'd been around age 16 when he fathered Josiah, right? All right. Uh, chapter 21 in verse 19, if you want to back up a few verses says, Ammon was 20 and 2 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 2 years in Jerusalem. Now look at verse 23. The servants of Ammon conspired against him, and he slew the king in his own house. And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. So this is what had happened. Josiah, young, 8 years old. His daddy gets killed. His daddy's the king. They come to little eight-year-old Josiah. His mom, what, 24, 23, somewhere all in there? And he becomes king. This gives you a little bit of the background of what's going on here. So here's Josiah. His grandfather, King Manasseh, had been dead only two years. King Manasseh. His father gets murdered... And now he's king at age eight. Okay. Josiah's grandfather was the most evil king that ever was. King Manasseh. He was so evil, the Lord said of him in 2 Kings 21, 13. If you want to look at that. He was so evil, the Lord said of him, I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish wiping it and turning it upside down. Manasseh would have been 67 years old when he died. 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 1. Add those years up. So of all ten evil kings, Manasseh was the most evil of all of them. And the Bible says his grandson, Josiah, ends up being the best of the best. Besides King David. 2 Kings 21 and verse 9. Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. What does that mean? Manasseh, the most evil king. The Bible says Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, chapter 23, verse 26, even after the reforms of Josiah, God remembered Manasseh, chapter 23 and verse 26. <coughs> I'm going to read that one to you. It says, Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with all. So even after Josiah, God remembered what Manasseh, his grandfather, had done. 
with all the reforms that Josiah brought to the country to be called the best king besides King David, God says, nevertheless, I'm still going to bring judgment because of Manasseh, his grandfather, right? 39, 40, 41 years earlier when he died. Folks, it's imperative that we remember these things that took place. <clears throat> so what was it that was going on in Israel, Judah? When Josiah was eight years old and he took over the throne. What was it that was so bad that Manasseh had done it, right? Manasseh seduced him to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. What was it that was so evil that Manasseh had seduced them to do that caused God to want to bring this vengeance upon that nation? What was going on when King Ammon, Josiah's father, was murdered two years before? Or two years after he came to office, right? 20, chapter 21, verse 19. Ammon was 22 years old when he began to reign. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. Look at verse 20. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh did. And then, of course, verse 23. It says, And the servants of Ammon conspired against him and slew the king in his house. So we have here, we understand what's going on. Ammon continued seducing Israel to do more evil than in the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel too. All that evil that those nations did that were before Israel came to the promised land. Now Manasseh had seduced the people of Israel to do those evils. He passes away his son Ammon continues to seduce him to do those evils. What was it that they were doing that was so bad? What was it that God wanted to bring judgment upon that nation even after Josiah brings all of the reform to that country? <coughs> Manasseh and Ammon were seducing men to have relations with anyone they could find to have relations with. Did you hear me? You see, it didn't matter. Let me read it again. Manasseh and Ammon were seducing men to have relations with anyone they could find to have relations with. It didn't matter who they were, anyone. This is what was going on in Israel. And that was what was going on there before Israel came there. And we need to understand this. Because it's happening today in our society. Amen? Amen. It didn't matter if it was your father. It didn't matter if it was your mother. It didn't matter if it was your sister. It didn't matter if it was your brother. Let's keep going. It didn't matter if it was your son. It didn't matter if it was your daughter. It didn't matter if it was your son-in-law. It didn't matter if it was your daughter-in-law. It didn't matter if it was your stepmother. It didn't matter if it was your stepfather. It didn't matter if it was your half-sister. It didn't matter if it was your half-brother. It didn't matter if it was your uncle. It didn't matter if it was your wife. It didn't matter if it was your neighbor. It didn't matter if it was your neighbor's wife. It didn't matter if it was your brother's wife. It didn't matter if it was your sister's husband. It didn't matter if it was your niece. It didn't matter if it was your nephew. <clears throat> it didn't matter if it was both a mother and her daughter. It didn't matter if it was a man and his son. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was two sisters. It didn't matter.
matter if it was two brothers. It didn't matter if it was a brother and a sister. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was a dog. It didn't matter if it was a goat. It didn't matter if it was a sheep. And it didn't matter if it was a donkey. It didn't matter. God, God's word says they were seducing men to have relations with anyone they could find to have relations with. It could be anybody. You just have relations with them. You see, this is what it said in the book that was written that Josiah heard from Shaphan the scribe. Right? <coughs> so much murder, so much hatred, so much lying, so much stealing, <coughs> so much cheating, so much drunkenness, so much unwanted pregnancy, so much child sacrifice, so much human trafficking, all of that was going on in the nation of Israel. And all of that's listed in the law that was read to King Josiah by Shaphan the scribe. No wonder it says there in verse 11. Look at verse 11. No wonder he tore his clothes. Right? What does it say, verse 11? It came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. <coughs> Josiah had grown up from age 8. And for 18 years he had watched, right? And he had learned, and he, I'm sure, had wondered why he was born into the situation that he was born into. Here I am. I have been king practically all of my life. For as long as I can remember, I can't remember not being very important. And the king. Why am I in this place in which I'm in? And then one day, Shaphan, the scribe, walks up. And he reads this. Josiah, we already know, he was concerned about the temple. He already had a heart for God because he wanted all that money. He said, take the money that's there, and y'all go take what stones you need, and you take what wood you need to have cut. And you fix the temple and you get it fixed up. And that's when they were gone and that's when they went and they found that book of the law. So he already had a heart for God. And now he's found out just how much trouble the nation of Judah is really in. He knows that God is going to bring his wrath. Because he knows what's going on in the country. He's had 18 years to learn about what was going on. And to try to be in charge of it. He knew all of these things. Verse 3, Shaphan the scribe. says there in verse 3. Came to pass in the 18th year, King Josiah, that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, What is a scribe? A scribe, we may think of them as the king's secretaries, writing his letters, drawing up his decrees, managing his finances. At a later period, the word again connects itself with the acts of numbering the military forces of the country. They had to do with transcribing old records. They put in writing what had been handed down orally. We read today in the uh, little devotion we have, you know, Hezekiah, uh, had recorded some of the things that Solomon had written there. The scribes would have done that. They wrote the professional secretaries to the king. So Josiah had known Shaphan all of his life. Josiah would have trusted Shaphan. Josiah, uh, Shaphan would have been much older than Josiah. I would imagine that, that jo uh, Shaphan had helped raise Josiah. 
had helped teach him some of these things. It was probably shaping that had an influence on him as to even wanting to go to the temple and have it repaired. He knew these things. Shaphan knew that this right here, after he read it himself, he knew that it was important. And so he took it to the king, the young king, and he read it to him. And later, after Josiah, he reads it, and he's so disturbed over what was said, the things that I, that I spoke to you. They read those things in Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 21. They read those things, and they knew they were in trouble. Josiah calls them all together. You can read in chapter 23 and verse 2 where Josiah calls all the men together of the country. And Josiah reads it to them himself. He says, y'all listen to what this says. You know, Jeremiah the prophet would have been there. He would have heard Josiah read those things that were in the law. He would have heard those things. Verse 10, Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has delivered me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. Chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Jeremiah, the prophet, would have been there. Verse 3, Josiah makes a covenant. Notice what it says in verse 3. He's so disturbed and so upset over what he's read there. Chapter 23, in verse 3. The king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. This was how serious it was. The king of the land had made this covenant. Josiah goes on and it says that we can read him as we study about Josiah and the reforms that he made. Josiah cleanses the temple of all of the idolatrous idols. They were all throughout the temple. He cleanses the temple. Josiah executes the idolatrous priests that were there. Put them to death. Put them to death. Josiah cleanses all of Jerusalem. He cleanses all of Judah. And he cleanses all of Samaria to the north. <clears throat> that would have been the places where it was prophesied two to three hundred years earlier that he would do. That prophecy was fulfilled as he went and he cleansed those places. The Bible is true. Amen. And then you have verse 20. <clears throat> Chapter 23, verse 20. It says that he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones and upon them and returned to Jerusalem. That would have been when he was up north. Amen. Chapter 24, Josiah executes all of the followers of witchcraft. All this was there in their country. Chapter 23 and verse 24. Moreover, the workers with the familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book of Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. That's verse 24. Verse 24, uh, 21, Josiah reinstitutes the Passover. Very important. Notice it says in verse 21. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Keep the Passover. So he reinstituted the Passover. Now here's where I am, church. <coughs> you would think, after all this, after all these reforms, after all these executions that took place, after grinding into powder those idols, putting them in the brook to flow away, you would think after all this that the people would change that were in the country. You'd think after Josiah, the nation would have changed for the good from then on. 
You would think that the parents would start teaching their children the right way, wouldn't you? You would think that the people of the land would have started making their pilgrimage to the temple like they should have and worship God and learn his word and kept the law. You would think that, wouldn't you? You would think that the parents would start setting good examples for their children, wouldn't you? All across the land. Josiah, he's taking this serious. We better get serious. We better do what we need to do. <coughs> you would think that's what would take place. You would think a nation would never go back down the terrible, God-forsaken, unholy, ungodly path that they had taken to get to where they were. You'd think that, wouldn't you? You'd think that Shaphan the scribe would have helped Josiah to bring a lasting change to Judah. Amen? Shaphan the scribe would have seen to it that his family was where they were supposed to be, learning the truth and learning what was right, learning what was wrong, standing against evil and standing for good and being on God's side. You would think that Shaphan would have done that. Amen? You'd think that. <clears throat> All through good King David's reign, the skull of the good kings. All through King Asa's reign, the Bible said he was good. All through King Jehoshaphat. Come on down the line. All through the book of 1 and 2 Kings. All through King Joash's reign, he was a good king. All through Amaziah and Uzziah and Jotham and the reigns of all these. The great grandfather of Josiah was Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah was the one that prayed and, and God killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. All through Hezekiah's reign, good king Hezekiah. And all through King Josiah's reign, there was, even then, in the hearts of the people, that thread of liberalism that we see today in our society. That thread of rebellion. That thread of carelessness. That thread of carelessness for God's word and the respect for God's house and a love for the truth. That thread of liberalism, it was there. It was there throughout all these kings' reign. And we see it today in our country. You see, we're seeing things going on today in our country and in our churches. Folks, we ought to be ashamed of what's going on. Yet we just go on like there's nothing happening that's wrong. We see children being born out of wedlock. And it's wrong. It's a shame. And we see that in our own churches, don't we? We see men living with men today. We see parents with their children today doing things that are ungodly. Say amen. We know it's going on, don't we? All of these things that, that was going on in the days of these kings that Josiah read and he saw it going on and he saw it going on in his own country. We see these things going on in our land today. Ezekiel chapter 8, 30 years later. All right. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 9. God has taken Ezekiel to Jerusalem, 500 miles away in the spirit. He's taken Ezekiel there. Then said he unto me, verse 8, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I have digged in the wall, behold a door. He said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. Right there in the, there, there in the temple. In the temple in Jerusalem 30 years later. In the temple. Look what it says in verse 11. There stood before them 70 men of the ancients in the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Now 
with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. They were worshiping false gods in God's temple. And the son of Shaphan the scribe was there. And the Bible mentions him specifically as being one of those ancients that were there. You would think that Shaphan would have seen to it that his children would know what the truth was and how serious it was. But we find out later, a generation goes by. One generation goes by. And we see that thread of liberalism, that thread that's there of, of, of disobedience, that thread of carelessness, that thread of, of, of unconcern that's there with those things that are sacred and holy before an almighty God. We see those things ignored and, and put aside and, and not cared about. We see those things. One generation goes by. And it's there again in the midst. Liberalism. Liberalism. Let's be liberal about things. We know what liberals do, don't we? We know what they say. They say equal opportunity. But they mean lower the standards, don't they? Sure they do. We know what they're doing. We know what they're saying. Liberals. They say tolerance and inclusion and be open-minded. But what they mean is give your approval and give your endorsement to these things that are going on. We know what they are. It's the same today as it was in those days. They didn't care. They wanted to be disobedient. And they wanted everybody to be disobedient. And they wanted those of us that believe God and His Word to hush and accept them and allow them to do those things. Contrary to the way Josiah was. And the Bible says Josiah was one of the best kings that there was. The best king. It's all the same today. Let me read Isaiah chapter 32 because I want you to know it's in God's Word. When was Isaiah alive? He was alive in Hezekiah's day. That was the great-grandfather of Josiah. Listen to what Isaiah says about liberals. Isaiah 32 verses 5 to 13. The vile person shall no more be called liberal like it's a good thing. Nor the churl said to be bountiful. A churl is someone that's greedy, stingy, to the point of being obnoxious. For the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy, right? Liberals, hypocrites. And, no, and to utter error against the Lord, and to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause to the drink of the thirsty to fail. The instruments also of the churl are evil. He devises wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaketh right. But the liberal devises liberal things. Amen. Let it go on. It doesn't matter. Just be liberal about the situation. Right? It doesn't matter if it's a man with another man. It doesn't matter if it's a man with his neighbor's wife. Be liberal about it. Just like we find in God's Word. The liberal devises liberal things. And by liberal things shall he stand. That gets back into that blasphemy against the spirit of truth, doesn't it? God will not forgive that. God doesn't forgive the wrong position. If you've got a wrong position on God's Word, He don't forgive it. Amen. Amen, Brother Bobby. Amen. Sure, that's true. This is what that generation of children was up against. <clears throat> Here's my question. What chance did those children in Josiah's day have? We 
We know that Josiah went through and had these reforms. He was called one of the greatest kings. He did away. He executed those idolatrous priests. He went through and tore down all of the all of the uh, idols in those high places. He tore them down. He burnt them. Did away with them. He made great reforms. And then we find the very next generation has fallen back into the same practices. What chance did those children have to be brought up right in his day? What chance did they have to be different than the previous generation? They had seen the things done right with their government. What chance did those children have as that king passes away and the next king comes in line and they start doing those same idolatrous, ungodly, unrighteous things? What chance did those children have to grow up and fear the Lord God? Amen. Here, here's a good question. What should those faithful believers have done What should those faithful believers have done to save that next generation that was coming? What should they have done? They should have fought tooth and nail for every single child that they could fight for. If they needed to go pick them up, they needed to go pick them up and bring them to the temple. That's what they needed. They should have not given up. They should have fought hard. They should have kept going. They should have been tireless. They should have been ruthless. They should have stood firm for what they knew was the truth because they knew the judgment that God would bring if they didn't do it. They knew the faith that stood before those children. They knew it. They knew it. And folks, that's what burdens my heart. Because all of those things, past a friend of mine, I'm going to share this with you. You can go to a brothel today in Europe for relations with an animal. Today. Amen. That's what he told me. And so I simply tell you this to tell you that God's word is true. And the things that we do that we want to put money into, that we want to build something for, <clears throat> for future generations. You see, we build this, this, this place here, this sanctuary, and we hope that it stands long years after we're gone. And the next generation that comes along will have old memories here as they were brought here as children. And we build a playground over there and we, and we spend money on it and we sweat and we get out there and we work like we do because we hope it's going to be something that will influence for years and years and years and years and years because we know what happens in one generation if we don't strive and try and dig and keep going and be ruthless and fight and scrap for every single child that we can save. What chance do they have? What chance do these children have with the world that they're coming up in? What chance do they have? They don't have a chance in hell without us. Now that's the simple truth of it. And God's word bears me out. Amen. They're, they're important. They need us. They need for us to care about them instead of caring about ourselves. They need for us to do that. So let's go out and let's get them. <coughs> and let's bring them in here. Amen. And let's teach them God's word. And let's teach them the truth. Let's go get them again the next time. Let's go get them again the next time. And the time after that. Amen. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see.
some of them, some of them come and accept Jesus Christ and serve Him and carry it on to the next generation. Amen. 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 I want to finish with Jesus Christ. We have hope today, don't we? Because of what Jesus has done for us. We don't deserve what He's done. Oh man, I'm going to run over again. I'm going to have to get that clock fixed. I wouldn't run over if that clock was fixed, would I? Maybe. But, folks, the hope that we have today is a hope that was bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. And I don't know what your background is. I don't know what your situation has been. I don't know what you're in today. But according to God's word, he will take you right where you are if you'll come to him. And he will save your soul from judgment if you'll come to him. And this is the message we need to tell those children. And this is the message we need to receive today if we need to be saved. Amen. All right, let's all stand together. <clears throat> in our song. Page 450. Okay. We'll sing one verse if the Lord's spoken to anyone's heart. What we'll do, we'll close with prayer and pray for our brothers. Bobby, I'm going to ask you to come and lead us in prayer for Vacation Bible School. <coughs> yeah. So if you would, lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again this morning. Thank you for the rest of the life, Lord. Be with us this coming week as we go out and pick up all the children, Lord, that we may lead them to you and lead their families unto you, Lord. Lord, let us come together in fellowship when they have fellowship in you. Be with us.